Hey folks, in this video we're going to talk about chronoamperometry, specifically what it is and how the technique is used. This video is broken up into several sections. First, we'll talk about what is chronoamperometry, what is the potentiostat doing to our electrochemical system and the response that it gives. We'll then talk about that response, what electrochemical processes give us that response, and the mathematical theory behind it. We'll finish off by talking about some of the technical issues that you might want to consider when doing chronoamperometry. Before we begin, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I want to let you know that on the Pine Research YouTube channel, my colleague Dr. Neil Spinner and I host an Ask Us Anything About Electrochemistry live stream on Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a great opportunity for you to ask us any questions that you might have about electrochemistry because I'm assuming if you're watching this video, you are learning electrochemistry and well, it's a, it's a pretty difficult subject. So if there's a subject that you need additional clarification on or some questions, the live stream is a great place for Neil and I to try to answer those questions or at least point you in the right direction. If you can't make it to the live stream, leave a comment on an upcoming live stream and we'll make sure to answer it during that live stream and you can watch it later. All right, just wanted to let you know about the Ask Us Anything About Electrochemistry live stream and let's start talking about chronoamperometry. Chronoamperometry is an electroanalytical chemistry technique where a potentiostat applies a step potential to an electrochemical system and we measure the current response as a function of time. In a typical three electrode system with a redox active analyte, we observe a spike in the current followed by a gradual decay. This is the shape of a typical chronoamperogram. Now, to understand this shape, we need to understand the electrochemical system. In a three electrode system, we have a working, counter, and reference electrode. The working electrode is the electrode where our redox reactions of interest are occurring on. That's what we're studying and the working electrode typically consists of a planar glassy carbon disc, usually several millimeters in outer diameter, encased in an inert shroud such that only the disc electrode is exposed to the electrochemical solution. We also implement a counter electrode which is used to maintain charge balance. So any reduction reactions that are occurring on the working electrode, there is an oxidation reaction occurring on the counter electrode and vice versa. We commonly employ a platinum coiled wire as a counter electrode. And lastly, we have the reference electrode which represents a stable reference point in our electrochemical system. Usually something like silver silver chloride is implemented as a reference electrode and silver silver chloride is a silver wire encased in a silver chloride salt in a glass tube with a solution of saturated potassium chloride and a small glass frit at the end to maintain electrical contact with the electrochemical solution. All three electrodes, working, counter, and referenced, are placed into a conductive electrolyte solution that contains a redox active analyte that we are interested in. This could be something like ferrous cyanide, ruthenium hexamine, or whatever molecule you are studying. And this makes up our electrochemical system. Prior to the potential step, the potential of the working electrode is held at such a point where no redox reactions are occurring, no Faradaic electron transfers are happening. When the experiment starts, we then step the potential to a point that is either sufficiently high to induce an oxidation reaction or sufficiently low to induce a reduction reaction. For example, the standard redox potential for the ruthenium hexamine 2 plus 3 plus redox pair is about minus 140 millivolts versus silver silver chloride. If my starting material is ruthenium hexamine in the 3 plus oxidation state, I might start the potential at plus 300 millivolts, keeping ruthenium hexamine in that 3 plus oxidation state. When the experiment starts, I would then step the potential to say minus 300 millivolts, sufficiently negative to reduce ruthenium hexamine from the 3 plus to the 2 plus oxidation state. When the potential is stepped, we observe this spike in the current followed by a gradual decay. Why is that? What processes are occurring on the electrode surface that give us this response. Well, there are two processes in particular that are responsible for this initial spike in the current. There is the charging of the electrical double layer and the reduction of ruthenium hexamine. 
let's talk about the electrical double layer first. First off, the electrical double layer is a very complex subject, and I would actually recommend that you read a book to really learn it or understand it more clearly. But for the sake of this video, the electrical double layer acts like a capacitor. And the capacitor consists of two oppositely charged parallel plates with a dielectric in between them, such that no charge passes from one plate to the next. If we think about the working electrode surface, if we apply a positive potential to our working electrode, we start to generate positive charge at the working electrode surface. That positive charge will attract negatively charged anions from our supporting electrolyte solution. Those anions will start to form a layer immediately next to the positively charged working electrode. So you have a layer of anions and then you have a layer of positive charge from the working electrode basically acting like a capacitor and there is no charge transfer. You're not oxidizing the anions in this case. So you have a capacitor at the working electrode surface, the electrical double layer. Now going back to our chronoamperometry experiment, this initial spike in the current, part of it is due to the charging of the electrical double layer and that charging is pretty fast. The speed at with which the electrical double layer charges is actually based on the capacitance of the double layer as well as the uncompensated solution resistance. We can model this based on electronics and, and circuitry as a resistor and a capacitor in series. And in this circuit, the time it takes to charge the capacitor is based on the RC time constant. The resistance times the capacitance gives us units of time. And specifically, five times RC or five RC is the time it takes to charge the electrical double layer. So depending on your electrochemical system, maybe you have a large uncompensated solution resistance or you have a small area electrode, so you have a low capacitance, the time it takes to charge the electrical double layer will vary. But in general, for a wide array of different electrochemical systems, we're looking at the charging of the electrical double layer on the microseconds to milliseconds timescale. So part of this large spike in current is associated with the charging of the electrical double layer. The other factor is the Faradayic current associated with ruthenium hexamine. The reduction of ruthenium hexamine from the 3 plus to the 2 plus oxidation state is one of the fastest electron transfer processes in all of electrochemistry. This results in a concentration gradient at the electrode surface where we start to lose, we deplete ruthenium hexamine 3 plus near the electrode surface and we have a lot more ruthenium hexamine 2 plus. This is sometimes referred to as the zone of depletion. If we look at the concentration profile as a function of the distance from the electrode, you'll see that the concentration of ruthenium hexamine 2 plus is highest at the electrode surface. And the concentration of ruthenium hexamine 3 plus is practically zero at the electrode surface, or at least close to zero. As we move further away from the electrode surface into the bulk, the concentration profile starts to change. We have more and more ruthenium hexamine 3 plus as we go into the bulk and less and less ruthenium hexamine 2 plus. However, this is just a snapshot in time. During a chronoamperometry experiment, the concentration profile will actually change as a function of time. The zone of depletion will start to increase. We'll have more and more ruthenium hexamine 2 plus as we go out from the electrode and less ruthenium hexamine 3 plus. This also describes why we see this gradual decay in the current. The current is associated with the reduction of ruthenium hexamine 3 plus. And if the concentration of ruthenium hexamine 3 plus is decreasing, over time, then the current will also decrease over time. Now you might be wondering how I got this really cool chronoamperometry data for this video. And while I could have generated the data experimentally, I actually simulated it. And you can too. Pine Research is proud to announce Aftermath Live, an online electrochemical simulation platform. It's an online streaming platform for your web browser, so you don't need to install any software and keep it up to date. It's updated automatically with the latest version. There's no cumbersome and expensive dongle, and you can use the software anytime you want. It can simulate chronoamp as well as cyclic voltammetry data. And it's a powerful research tool when it comes to modeling your electrochemical experiments.
experimental data to an electrochemical mechanism. But personally, I have found Aftermath Live to be very powerful when it just comes to helping me learn electrochemistry. If I've ever wondered, what does the cyclical tamogram look like if the heterogeneous rate constant is very slow? I can simulate it. What would it look like if the electrical double layer capacitance was very large? I can simulate it. And in the case of chronoamperometry, I mentioned how ruthenium hexamine has a very fast electron transfer rate, one of the fastest in all of electrochemistry. What if that rate was very slow? How would my chronoamperogram change? I could simulate that and learn. Similarly, the animation for the concentration profile as a function of distance from the electrode, that animation came from Aftermath Live, and that was for a very simple system. What if I had multiple electron transfer or multiple chemical steps in that chronoamperogram? How would the concentration profile change? I could simulate it and learn. Right now, we're running a special offer. In the description below, there is a code for 5% off your first month of the basic and research versions of Aftermath Live. And if you are a YouTube member, you get an additional discount where the code can be found in the community chat of your membership tier. Signing up for Aftermath Live is easy and you can cancel at any time. Check out the link below in the description for Aftermath Live and use the discount code to get 5% off your first month. All right, let's finish talking about chronoamperometry. So we now have a better conceptual understanding of chronoamperometry. We understand the electrochemical processes that are occurring. We also understand the shape of the chronoamperogram. Now the current response in a chronoamperometry experiment has been mathematically derived for a linearly diffusion controlled species via the Cottrell equation, which you can see right here. The Cottrell equation states that the time dependent current is equal to the number of electrons transferred, Faraday's constant, the area of the electrode, the diffusion coefficient raised to the one half power, and the bulk concentration of our analyte, all divided by pi to the one half and time to the one half. If we were to plot the current versus one over the square root of time, we would get what was known as a Cottrell plot. And the slope of the Cottrell plot can give us information about things like the diffusion coefficient if we know the value of the other variables. However, the Cottrell equation and the Cottrell plot only considers current associated with a diffusion controlled redox reaction. It does not take into account the current associated with electrical double layer charging. So if we want to use our chronoamperometry data to calculate things like the diffusion coefficient or the concentration or the area, we would need to exclude data points that are convoluted by electrical double layer charging. Remember earlier, the electrical double layer is basically completely charged after 5RC, and depending on your electrochemical system, that could be several microseconds or several milliseconds. But if we exclude that data in the first few milli or microseconds of our experiment, it excludes that 5RC, we should be good. We can use that data to do calculations. However, if we wait too long, if we allow the chronoamperometry experiment to go too long, we might start to see issues with convection, subtle vibrations that occur over time. And in that case, with convection interfering with our data, we also would not have a diffusion controlled current response. So there's a little bit of trial and error that has to take place, but you would want to only use the data after 5RC and maybe just a few seconds beyond that when using chronoamperometry to calculate things like the diffusion coefficient, the area, or the concentration. All right, folks, thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like. If you have any questions, write them in the comment section below. And for more on Pine Research, don't forget to subscribe. Also, check out our Ask Us Anything About Electrochemistry live stream. Sometimes we'll answer your questions in the comment section there. So I would give that a go, check it out. Also, check out Aftermath Live. Uh, I think if you just sign up for one month and just play around with the electrochemical parameters, you'll really learn a lot. And when it comes to your electrochemical education, it's really priceless. So give it a shot, use the discount code in the description below and check out Aftermath Live. All right, thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.